So I'm going to talk a little bit about the EU model and how it relates to the electricity in the human body and specifically the magnetic field or hypothetical magnetic field that surrounds the human body, which has been my area of research for the last 21 years. So I am the originator of a sound therapy method called biofield tuning. I'm the author of a book called Tuning the Human Biofield, and this is based on my master's thesis, which was called Exploring the Effects of Audible Sound on the Human Body and its Biofield. And I'm also the founder of the nonprofit Biofield Tuning Institute that we've set up to conduct research into the hypothesis that I formed from doing this research. So biofield tuning is a sound therapy method that uses uh, single tone acoustic frequency generators, also known as tuning forks. And it's been developed over the last 21 years in my clinical research. I started off with a part-time massage therapy practice and read some books on the use of color and sound and vibration and healing, which seemed very logical to me as I had come to understand that everything is really vibration. And so if I'm vibration, treating vibration with vibration seemed very uh, logical and elegant to me. And so I read a bunch of books on the subject and then came across a set of tuning forks for healing in a catalog and ordered them spontaneously and started playing with them in my massage practice. And <clears throat> I made a lot of curious observations doing this work that uh, led me here. So the, it interacts with the human biofield. So biofield is a term that was chosen by the National Institute of Health in 1994 to define the electrical and magnetic aspect of the human body. And essentially what it does is it improves the signal to noise ratio of this system in the body. And it produces predictable, consistent therapeutic outcomes. Um, myself over many thousands of sessions, and I've trained over 700 people in small classes how to do this method, and they also have the same kinds of outcomes that I've gotten, which we'll talk about. So I know that one of the uh, cardinal sins of PowerPoint is having lots of words, and there's lots of words on these next slides, but the reason why I've done that is so that if anybody's interested, and I'm gonna give you a lot of information, it's probably a lot of stuff you've never heard before, and if anybody wants to go back and read it, I will post this on slideshare.net later, so this information is all here. <clears throat> so right off the bat, I mean, from the very first day that I picked up the tuning forks, um, I started to observe things that I really didn't expect to observe. And uh, one was that the sound changed when I was moving it around the body. I'd activate the fork and I'd hold it in different areas around the body. And I observed that it changed and changed dramatically. Sometimes it would go very sharp, sometimes flat, sometimes full of static. Sometimes it would disappear altogether. Sometimes it would get very loud. And that in those changes in tone, it wasn't the fundamental tone that was changing, it was the overtones and the undertones that seemed to be bending and morphing and engaging in different expressions as I moved them around. And I started to identify certain things. I, I discovered that I had this curious ability that whenever the tone changed, I seemed to know what it was. And so I discovered that certain emotional states, like if people came in and they were feeling emotional, um, that different emotions actually produced different sounds. For example, if somebody was sad, I would find a, a tone that would sound like a minor third in music that was evocative of sadness. Um, that also, um, things like fear, and some of the ones that we've identified quite easily, uh, fear, which has a pulsing quality to it that you hear in the overtones. So, you know, when you get very scared and you actually start to shake, that's the waveform of that emotion moving through your tissues. Depression actually has an undertone, a kind of boom that you can hear. Um, alarm also has a sort of sharp quality to it. And... Interestingly, I've observed these different emotional emanations coming out of not only people, but also animals and even plants. I've done um, some, a little bit of research on plants and discovered that plants produce a similar vibration of fear to humans. So there actually appears to be this sort of universal emotional language. 
Um, I also discovered as I was working around the body, and initially I started just working over the body, and I did this for 10 years, just kind of working over the body. Um, but then I accidentally discovered a loud spot uh, about three feet off of someone one day. And so that led me to start exploring the area around the body up to a distance of about six feet. That was all I could kind of get to in my room. And I started discovering all, all kinds of really interesting phenomena. And my therapeutic outcomes, actually, which had already been pretty cool, uh, became really dramatic. They became really, really dramatic when I started working on the field. So this was very, very intriguing to me. And at the t you know, I'd only done this part-time, kind of as a hobby for years. Uh, when I told people that I was using tuning forks for healing, there was a kind of universal knee-jerk uh, skeptical response to that. There's just something about it sounds kind of fruity. Uh, so I didn't really want it to be my vocation. I didn't want to be perceived as a Fruit Loop. <laughs> so, uh, but, but when this started happening, I realized I was onto something and that I, one, needed to understand it better, um, but two, also needed to bring it out into the world just to help people to feel better. So, what revealed itself to me as I worked in the field was that I found about five to six feet away from the body, there seemed to be a band that was about an inch and a half wide that seemed to have greater resistance or a sense of charge or where the tuning fork would go very loud. And I learned wherever the tuning fork got loud that there was more energy there. I didn't know what the energy was, but that was the only word that I could use. And that, that I couldn't move this. Because uh, I had discovered that I could actually move the loud spots that I found with the tuning fork. Almost like you might use a magnet to move iron filings. And I had decided that if it, it was going to be loud anywhere, it should probably be in the midline of the body or over the chakras, which was um, the way that the tuning forks came. They said, you work with the chakras. And so I, I had developed this process I called click, drag, and drop, where I'd click on a loud spot, sort of pick it up with the tuning fork, and then sort of drag it to the chakra and drop it in, and then it would be loud over the chakra. But this band at the outer edge, I couldn't move. It wouldn't, it wouldn't move. It just sort of stayed there. And, um, and, it, and it seemed to be about five to six feet out on the sides and about two to three feet out on the top and bottom. And what I discovered as I was combing through people's energy fields or biofields was I was finding their memories. I would, I would hit an area where the tone would change really dramatically. For example, I might hit a spot on the left side of somebody's heart out here, and it would all of a sudden sound terribly sad. And, and I would get this sort of note that would drop into my mind, and it would say something like, sadness, age 12. And I'd ask my client, what happened when you were 12 that was sad? And they'd say, oh, that was when my grandmother died, and we were really close. And so I started to discover that, that the, this field seemed to be filled with memories, and that memories that were traumatic or difficult actually produced um, turbulence and, and noise, and that simply holding a fork in that spot caused the body to become aware of its own noise, and it would spontaneously auto-tune itself. And the noise would resolve, and the sense of resistance or charge that I was encountering would let go from that particular spot, and I would be able to move it. People would tell me that they felt much better afterwards. So, you know, the, the tuning fork is almost like a needle on an album, and as it moves in towards the body, it's actually broadcasting what I believe are standing waves that are embedded with this information. And that traumatic experiences um, cause uh, magnetic lumps, <laughs> or, or what Wall called uh, congealed ether. And definitely a sense of stuckness or something not moving, and just like they use sound to break up kidney stones into smaller bits so that the body can circulate and pass them, uh, it seems like the tuning forks were doing the same thing in the field, that I would be able to move these. So um, I have just a little video here uh, of this idea of these standing waves, and that's an area of turbulence. A tuning fork comes in, and it harmonizes these waveforms and allows the energy that has been stuck there to return back to the body and come back into circulation. So um, not only did different emotions produce different sounds, but also 
different pathologies as well. So, you know, in your car, you know your car is running smooth if it's not making noise, but if something goes wrong, your CV boot starts to let go, uh, it'll start making a particular noise. And a good mechanic can get in your car and drive it and identify what's wrong by the noise it's making. And it's the same with your body. If everything is functioning properly, it doesn't really make noise. But if something starts to go wrong, the waveforms that it's producing start to become incoherent. So, for example, if someone has a fatty liver, it produces a very different sound when I ping it, when I bounce sound off of it and listen to it, than a healthy liver. Um, an arthritic joint actually will produce a kind of grainy sound, whereas a healthy joint won't. Um, and also, from a perspective of adrenals, uh, if you suffer from adrenal burnout, which great many people do, you might go see a doctor or na maybe a naturopath who'd give you a lot of herbs and supplements. But if you go to see a biofield tuner, uh, we will lock phase with your adrenal rhythm, right past the end of your fingertip. And we will move slowly in towards your body, having a conversation with that adrenal and allowing it to hear the fact that it's running too high and too fast. And when your body becomes self-aware and it uses that steady, coherent input to balance itself, we can actually get that adrenal rhythm to come back to what I call its factory settings. And then you don't need to take dozens of bottles of pills. Um, so some pathologies can really be adjusted, some not so much. If it's really gone deeply into the body, it's not as easy to shift it, or if there's nerve damage, pinched nerves, that sort of thing. But a great many things ha have responded very beautifully to this. So, <clears throat> so as noise and resistance in the field gives way, um, the body relaxes. Where, you know, whenever you're around a, a, a strong noise, you tend to go into resistance around that. And it's the same with the noise in our own system. So any of these places where we've taken a hit in life, whether it's a car accident or a divorce or a bankruptcy, um, you know, those live on in your field. And your, your biography becomes your biology. And, and, and it's all related to different kinds of tensions that are blocking flow. So once we release the resistance and the charge and the turbulence from the blueprint of the body, from the magnetic field, then the body will also, and then breath and blood and electricity and information all begin to flow and the body just self-repairs. Most people say that they feel lighter after a session and they definitely look lighter. It's a, it's a very syntropic or anti-entropic process. We're actually kind of reversing the effects of aging. And over the years that, uh, that I've been receiving this work, I've healed a, a great many ailments. And I'm you know, happy to say that uh, at 48, I'm healthier and stronger than I've ever been as a consequence of receiving regular biofield grooming. So some of the other things that we've, um, been helpful with pain, uh, anxiety, depression, vertigo, digestive disorders, PTSD, addiction, panic disorders, phobias, adrenal fatigue, and much more. And it does it very elegantly. It does it very quickly. You know, I've had people who've had massive anxiety disorders resolve in one session, or pain that they've had for 30 years disappear in one session, because most therapies are working on the body, which is the effect. But we're actually getting into the cause here. And so it, once you resolve the cause, then the body takes care of itself. Interestingly, it can also be conducted at a distance. And uh, people asked me for years if I could do this at a distance. And I always said, absolutely not. You know, I'm using, I'm using sound waves on the body. Like, this is physics. There's, it's not done at a distance. And then uh, my, one of my mentors, the gentleman who wrote the foreword to my book, uh, Dr. Carl Merritt, an MD in California, he persuaded me to give it a try, and I was so skeptical about it. Um, but he lay down on a treatment table in his office in California, and I pretended that he was on my treatment table in Vermont. And I approached the table as if he was really there. And I would start at someone's foot and start to move in towards the body and kind of work my way around. And one of the curious observations that I made was that the field, in addition to having 
um, emotions being stored in particular areas. Like every time you feel sad, you express the waveform of sadness. It actually seems to be stored right in here. Or every time you feel angry or you express the waveform of anger, that record seems to be stored in here. Or every time you worry about the future, you're spinning something right in here. Uh, I also discovered that there was a timeline aspect to this storage system in that as information was generated, it seemed to move away from the person. You know, like hair kind of grows and moves away from you. So information that I was finding at the very outer edge of the field related to a person's gestation and birth, that double layer membrane at the outer edge seemed to hold um, the memory of gestation. And then, uh, kind of like rings in a tree, as we move in closer to the body, we move towards current time. And it's very equidistant. So if somebody was 60, I would find information about halfway through their field related to when they were 30. And so I went through uh, Dr. Merritt's field, and I wrote down all of the things that I found. He had some organs that weren't quite right. He had some inflammation in a particular shoulder. There were certain ages where things had happened. I'm also able to tell about a person's parents' personalities. And, uh, and I called him when I was done, and I told him, I shared with him all my notes. And he said, Eileen, all of those things are exactly correct. And I definitely felt a state change receiving this. So <laughs> that was pretty wild. And so then I started exploring doing it at a distance and you know, trying to understand how on earth does this work at a distance? In fact, how is this even working at all? It definitely brought up a great many questions for me. So one of the questions was, um, what is this apparent stuff that I am encountering with the tuning forks? Because it really felt like stuff. And I would be moving in towards the body and I'd hit something it wouldn't, it wouldn't want to move, you know? It would just really feel solid. And then after a little while of hanging out there and the sound sort of breaking it up and harmonizing the chaos, then it would move. And it would come and it would go into the body. And so there definitely appeared to be some kind of mass or charge that I was working with. And I was really confused about what it was. Um, and, and why does it appear to have charge or resistance? I also was very curious about the fact that the tuning fork could move it. And I was like, well, what law of physics is governing the fact that this vibrating tuning fork seems to be moving this stuff? And, you know, I tried to find physicists to talk to about this. I'm like, hi, I'm a sound therapist who uses tuning forks in the body's energy field. <laughs> I'm trying to understand this. And, you know, of course, it was very hard. Thankfully, Wall was happy to talk to me. So <laughs> I'm grateful for that. And it's been very helpful. I also, as this whole territory emerged, as this pattern emerged over the course of a, a number of years, what I call the biofield anatomy map, I was puzzled, I, I was really puzzled if I was discovering something that nobody else had. Like, I had a really hard time believing that, that I had sort of found some territory that had been hidden in plain sight that nobody had really explored yet. And I, I'm a really rabid researcher. I've read a great many books, academic and self-help, and, but also sort of esoteric, trying to find model that this could fit into. And I also wondered if this pattern, you know, of apparent memory storage, kind of in our own personal cloud, right, around our body, storing all our memories, is it really there, or am I somehow just making all of this up? And, you know, even when I, when I first started teaching classes in 2010, I had a group of clients who kind of bullied me into teaching. I didn't feel quite ready yet, but I was really reluctant to teach them the biofield anatomy because it was one person's subjective experience, and I, I didn't feel right teaching it, but I did teach it, and they were able to use it, and they were able to follow the map, and they were able to find the same things. And, you know, they said to me, Eileen, it doesn't matter if it exists or not, you know, it's a model that works. And that satisfies me to a degree, but I'm still incredibly curious uh, if there is a way to objectively determine if my observations are actually there. Uh, so, I was in the middle of, of asking all of these questions and trying to find answers when uh, my son, who was 12 at the time, came to the dinner table and he said, did you know there's a fourth state of matter called plasma? <laughs> and I was like, solid, liquid, gas. No, somehow I missed a whole state of matter when I was learning about such things. And he went on to describe a little bit of it. 
And so that, in that same conversation, we were talking about space and whether space was a vacuum or not. And, uh, and I said, you know, I think I read somewhere once that space isn't really an empty vacuum. Like, there's actually something there. My husband was like, oh, of course, space is a vacuum. Right? That's what we've been told. Uh, so I went and I searched on the internet, uh, space is not a vacuum, and turned up plasma. <laughs> and that led me down the plasma rabbit hole. It's been down the plasma rabbit hole, right? <laughs> and, uh, and obviously, um, led me to EU. And finding EU was so exciting to me. It, it was really, um, it was what I'd been looking for, and I didn't even realize it. You know, like most young Americans, I had suffered a great deal of angst and went looking in self-help books trying to find uh, answers. And I remember I read hundreds of them, but none of them were right or worked because I kept on needing more and more. And the self-help book to end all self-help books for me wasn't even a self-help book. It was uh, The Electric Sky by Donald Scott. And when I read that, it suddenly dawned on me that it's our cosmological story that's the problem. You know, it's, it's really grim and depressing and isolated and cold, and it doesn't make any sense at all. And yet we all kind of walk around influenced by it. And so when I, when I discovered plasma in EU, it was, it was like a religious experience. I felt connected. You know, my, my sort of yogic mind, the idea that all is one, um, now had a scientific framework to attach to, and it was such a relief to me. It was a real joy. But it also helped me to better understand the phenomenon that I was encountering. And it gave me a framework to attach it to and uh, allowed me to form what I call the biofield anatomy hypothesis. And it basically says that what we call mind and memory, rather than existing inside the body or in addition to that, exists as a diffuse magnetic toroid that surrounds and interpenetrates the body. And that it is um, a bioplasma, uh, similar to plasma, but related to biological organisms. It's bounded by a double layer membrane, and it contains standing waves that are what seem to me to be binary encoded. It seems very, very mathematical to me. When I started doing the distance sessions and I didn't have a body there to ask questions to or to clarify, it forced me to listen more deeply to try to understand what I was encountering. And, and there was a very strong mathematical component to it, just like music. So this field is, is, it has an anatomy, it's stratified, it's uh, compartmentalized, it has some interesting features, and I'll share some of those, and it's also timeline. And uh, traumatic or stressful experiences or time periods show up as areas of turbulence and resistance or charge in this field. So this is the biofield anatomy map, you can't really see it, but I go in detail in this in my book, and basically what I've discovered is that when people begin to develop pathologies in their physiology, it's usually because there's some kind of pathological oscillation out in their field, something in their biography is becoming their biology. Um, so for example, if, uh, if anybody has issues with their right hip, I've found that that is often related to what I call busy mind, busy body. It's the hip of over compulsive overdoing. Um, if you have an issue with your left shoulder, uh, it's very often related to old, undigested, unexpressed sadness. And, uh, you know, this map just plays itself out over and over and over again. We see how things um, relate to it. So the biofield anatomy hypothesis, you know, anytime you have a hypothesis, you want to look at other models that it might fit into. So uh, obviously, electric universe theory, I found correlations. I see it also in Gerald Pollack's work, uh, Rupert Sheldrake's work. Uh, I'm gonna, and I'm going to talk about each one of these and how it relates. So one of the really interesting ways it fits into EU is with Squatter Man. And, um, just like I said about that, how that field at the outer edge, I couldn't get that loud area to move. But I also discovered two fixed points within the field, here and here. And they're about the size of my fist. And those wouldn't move either. And upon investigation and deep listening, I found that the one on the left side held information related to a person's mother. And so I could stick a fork in that very specific spot and tell a client all about their mother's personality and then explore you know, the area in between that spot and their body and describe to them the quality of their relationship 
always just spot on. And same with the father side. And so when I came across these images, you know, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's interesting, that fits. Also, the idea of, um, you know, anything that is electromagnetic is going to have this toroidal field around it and a double layer membrane at the outer boundary. And these are just some images that, you know, show the, the same ideas, just the, the sort of fractal nature of how the idea of the magnetic field of the human body kind of fits in with a larger way that plasma works. So you guys all know about Gerald Pollack, but again, the sort of idea that charge kind of creates these outer boundaries. Um, and then the work of uh, Rupert Sheldrake, the idea that we, you know, we are informed by fields of information and that we're constantly adding to that. So, you know, we, we have, we're our own Akashic record of everything that ever happens to us gets stored, um, I think, more in the etheric layer the, in the, the, of the overall field. Um, I've been, this year I spoke at the Science of Consciousness conference in La Jolla, and there's uh, several people within that group that are talking about microtubule theory and how microtubules may be related to consciousness. So uh, on the surface of every cell membrane, you have these primary cilia that are like little antenna that vibrate in relationship to incoming vibrational information. And I think that these are actually the antenna that are receiving and transmitting the information that's held in the field. So that the cell is informing the field and the field is informing the cell. Another model that uh, what I'm found really fits into is Franz Anton Mesmer. And back in you know, the late 1700s, he was working with what he called um, animal magnetism, their magnetic fluid around the body. He was doing really exactly what I'm doing. He was using metal rods and then he was using his hands. He was also using sound as well. He had an invention that Benjamin Franklin had made that was uh, like wine glasses all in a bowl of water on a spindle and when you made them wet and spin them. So he was actually using sound and his hands to move energy in people. And he, uh, you know, He's often cited as kind of the end of the vitalist because he was condemned for his work and then this whole idea of the field kind of went away. Harold Saxton Burr was a professor of medicine at Yale and he became very interested in the magnetic fields around living things and did quite a lot of study on them. He called them L fields and he apparently had meters on trees around the Yale campus and that sort of thing. Um, but he, he kind of came, his research in the, in the 40s, uh, what they were doing was giving way to chemical research and the, the idea of a pill for every problem. And so, you know, the L fields also were kind of pushed aside. Robert Becker wrote a book called The Body Electric. He wrote that in 1998, and he did some very groundbreaking research on how electricity is involved in regeneration. Interestingly, he was really concerned about how non-natural electromagnetic fields were affecting human beings. And again, as another researcher, you know, it was kind of pushed aside, pushed down as research wasn't continued. This book, Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis by James Oshman, is a great overview on just the electrical nature of the body. And this book is a definitive tome. Uh, this book has almost 800 pages, and I read it twice as I was writing my master's thesis. And it's a really, if anybody's interested in the energy around the human body, subtle, subtle energy, that sort of thing, I really recommend reading this book. It's exhaustively researched with all kinds of very interesting things. And after reading it the second time, I pretty much came to the conclusion that what we call subtle energy or chi is essentially a diffuse magnetism. It's sort of like how water vapor is to water. So it sort of behaves, it's the same thing, but it's more diffuse and it obeys different laws. Jerry Tennant, who's here this afternoon, we've had the good fortune of hanging out with him and doing some work. And one of my big takeaways from Jerry is that we've really been conditioned to think of our bodies in terms of their chemical and mechanical aspect. And Jerry's work really reveals the, um, the electrical nature. And I love this idea that when we have a low pH, 
we actually have low voltage. And, and so getting people to start to think about their bodies in terms of their own electrical nature instead of their chemical nature is really a, it's a paradigm shift. It also fits in with the Vedic tradition, so the idea that we have these major energy centers or chakras in the body, um, and then these also these gradations of subtlety from the most gross to the most fine moving out away from the body. And in biofield tuning, we actually have what we call the four-inch zone and the 10-inch zone that are like atmospheric gradations of magnetic density. So when you come in, we, we don't sense any of the ones further out, but when you get to be about 10 inches of the way away from the body, you can sense with the tuning fork that it's, the terrain has suddenly become more dense. And then when we get to about four inches away from the body, it's actually so dense that we don't even work there. We just kind of skip right over it. Interestingly, uh, the chakras, every place where there's a chakra, in, in this model of, of seven chakras, and there's really quite a lot of different models out there of you know, how energy flows through the body, and this is just the model we work with. But everywhere where there's a chakra in this model, there's actually a nerve plexus, so it would make sense that there's more biological activity and then more subtle energy activity as well. There's also a lot of different theories out there about how chakras spin. And some people claim they spin clockwise, and some people claim they spin counterclockwise, and some people say, you know, this one is clockwise and this one is counterclockwise. Um, like Don, I think that they spin both ways, and that we have, a, we have an outgoing aspect and an ingoing aspect. And so that's another fractal representation. And you can see that here is that uh, a plasma focus device creates something that looks like a chakra and appears to spin, um, you know, in the, same, in the same way. Also the idea of Birkeland current. So in the Vedic model, we have uh, a central neutral channel and then the Ida and the Pingala, which represent the masculine and feminine currents going through the body, traveling both directions. So that, you know, mimics a the fill, we see the filamentary nature and meridians and um, also things called nadis. So there's a, there's a real, you know, as above, so below kind of <clears throat> correlation here. It also fits in with the, you know, traditional healing of shamanism. In, in shamanism, if a person has suffered a trauma... Um, and that they can't digest and that they can't manage, they might move away from that in time and space, but they never really deal with it. And, and they say that a piece of a person's soul breaks off and stays there. And what a shaman will do is enter into a meditative state, undergo a, a sort of a journey of the imagination back in time, find that soul fragment, and bring it back to a person's body where they'll either blow it or place it into the body. And so when I started working out in the field, and it was dawning on me that these, these lumps of magnetism were, um, in, in essence, soul fragments, and that what I was doing was picking them up and returning them back into the body. And, and that is you know, sort of like defragmenting your hard drive, um, but also making whole. Because, you know, when we, we all know, or maybe we are, that we're that way ourselves, you know, if we've had a lot of trauma, you're kind of fractured or splintered. And uh, this process does the same thing. And so when it was dawning on me, there was the same thing. I called it sonic soul retrieval. And, and rather than, you know, with a shaman, you might get one piece uh, returned to you. In a biofield tuning session, you, you have multiple soul fragments brought back to wholeness. So it's also in the spirit of EU, uh, approaching body and mind from this perspective is very cross-disciplinary, and these are just some of the, a few of the ones that I see from a cosmological perspective. You know, if we think of ourselves as electrical humans in an electrically connected universe, that's a cosmology of connection, and I, I think that's one of the greatest ills in our culture, is that everyone is laboring under the illusion of separation. It creates a kind of Cartesian anxiety that really infuses our culture, and it's really just based on misinformation and misperception. Uh, 
physics, so sound is magnetic. So I, I was always searching, for years, I was searching sound is magnetic in the internet, trying to find some kind of evidence of the magnetic qualities of sound. And it wasn't until this past year that I finally came across a study where a group of scientists had determined that sound in a particular frequency range actually exhibits magnetic properties. Well, a tuning fork as an acoustic instrument, especially the aluminum ones we use, technically produces an infinite number of overtones. So we are producing sound in that range. So I did finally find the answer to that, and that was a relief. Um, also, the physics concepts of resonance and entrainment. So initially, a tuning fork will find the distortion, and it will resonate with it, and it will produce the sound of that. But in fairly short order, because it's a stronger signal and because it's highly coherent, it will entrain the body into a more coherent expression. Uh, mathematical, you know, the, the emotions are very mathematical. Um, you know, even just the, the whole architecture of the body is all very mathematical. And the tonal expressions can very much be like in the music. It's how I was able to understand these different tones that I was encountering because, in the, because music seeks to evoke this. It really is a universal language and music is seeking to evoke it and you can really hear it in the forks. We also know that uh, the tuning forks and certain kinds of music stimulate the production of nitric oxide in the body and nitric oxide is a vasodilator and a muscle relaxer. So people enter into a relaxed, alert state when they receive sound therapy. It can definitely help with a wide range of physical issues. And from a psychological perspective, it's a whole new way of understanding the mind. And I feel very privileged to have spent the last 20 years with my hands actually inside people's minds. It's given me tremendous insight into how we work and our patterns of balance and imbalance, and really shown me that, you know, that our diseases really do begin in the mind. They begin in the field. So I feel like, uh, you know, as far as future science goes, that in this rudimentary research that I've begun, and it's really felt very often like a sort of a blind grope in the dark with moments of illumination as I've seen patterns or connections, um, that there's a whole new field here just waiting to be explored. And it's exciting because even with a simple tool like a tuning fork, um, we're able to produce such wonderful outcomes for people to help them out of suffering of all kinds. And I, I do believe that, you know, when we really are able to explore this more, um, you know, in it are the seeds of healthy humans, staying healthy and not getting sick. And I know that eliminates a lot of jobs, but <laughs> I know we don't all need jobs. <clears throat> So I've done some research. I discovered when I started my PhD that nothing made me happier than sitting in a lab quantifying this. Very exciting to see, to put numbers to this or images. So this particular image is medical thermal imaging. And the top one, this person has congested sinuses. And I worked on, on a little bit weighted forks on their body, um, but mostly worked in their field, and within about 15 minutes, we took another image, and the, all their congestion was gone. And this isn't the best image. Uh, the data, the raw data of this disappeared, but one of the other things that I did was we worked with a biophoton counter in a Faraday cage, and I hypothesized that biofield tuning reduces biophotonic emission by creating greater coherence in the person's electrical system. And so this was a classmate's, the photon emission from her throat center, uh, then I did about a 15-minute tune-up on her, and we took it afterwards, and it had dropped by about 22%, her photon emission. So that was also neat to see. Uh, this is another device called a biofield viewer, and what this is is it's a, basically a light meter that is reading how light is being absorbed and reflected by the body. And in this particular person, I worked in their lower uh, left abdomen, and you can see in the first image that there's an imbalance in that image, and then in the second, it's more balanced. I'm excited about the research we're doing currently. So I've partnered with an organization based out of San Diego called the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. And this is a woman by the name of Dr. Shamini Jan, who's, who I actually cited in my book, who's published a number of peer-reviewed papers on the biofield. 
um, Dr. Richard Hammerschlag and Dr. David Musham. And so what we've done, I've gotten a couple of small grants to get us this far, is what we're looking for inter-rater agreement. So if we have a body lying on a table and we bring in three different biofield tuning practitioners in succession, are they going to find the same areas of perturbation? Are they going to find the edge in the same place? And obviously we're not in there when we're, each person is working. And are we going to find the same perturbations? And so we have, uh, <clears throat> this is just a screenshot of the, our pre-pilot data, but after we conducted our, our pre-pilot, they were very excited about the data and felt like it was robust enough to move on to a full study. And this is currently, the IRB submission is being written up, and then we'll be starting fundraising for this study, which will then be submitted to peer-reviewed journals. So that's pretty exciting to have that underway. So um, right now, what I want to do is just uh, take off my science research hat and put on my health and wellness educator hat, because the whole reason why I came to all of this was to get myself healthy. We live in an incredibly unhealthy culture, and to actually succeed in being healthy, you have to be a bit of a rebel. And so I want to share with you what I've learned, uh, just some, some tips on how to take care of your electrical body and become healthy, looking at it from that perspective. So in, in new age communities, which you know I've kind of circled around the fringes of, again, trying to understand the aura and that sort of thing, um, there's this whole idea where people are trying to raise their vibration. Um, you know, as a, as a sound therapist, I take umbrage with the fact that people have trouble with low vibrations. It's all, you know, it's all good. Uh, so we're not trying to raise our vibration, rather we're trying to raise our voltage. The more voltage you can carry in your system, the healthier you're going to be. So these are just some things that you can do to raise your voltage. Um, sleeping from 10 to 6, and this is at the top of my list for a reason. I really discovered early on that if I didn't get enough regular sleep, that everything kind of unraveled from there. And so from an Ayurvedic perspective, sleeping from 10 to 6 is ideal from your body, for your body. Uh, earthing, really getting in contact with your bare feet on the earth. When I first started doing this as a practice and going out walking barefoot on grass in the mornings, I couldn't believe how much better I felt. You know, and I've taught yoga and I've done this, I've done all kinds of things. I've explored so many avenues of health. And I really couldn't believe that it was as simple as taking off my shoes. And recently I've started wearing leather sole moccasins everywhere. And it's extraordinary. You know, I think we could actually track the rise in chronic disease to the use of rubber-soled shoes. So I would highly encourage you to take care of your electromagnetic body by grounding and earthing regularly because it's, it's really huge. We don't realize that things kind of bounce back at us from our rubber-soled shoes. And we, we end up piling up a lot of electrostatic energy and inflammation. Uh, breathing deeply. Remember to take a big breath. It's really, really important. A lot of us are shallow breathers, especially those of us who tend to be thinkers. Uh, consciously receiving love and gratitude and attention. You know, these are currencies. And a lot of times when people try to give you love or give you gratitude, they're actually giving you energy. They're giving you electricity. And you, you know, it, it's important then rather than brushing it off that you receive that because it's, it's energizing. I love um, Jerry Tennant's phrase, uh, electron stealers versus electron donors. So we all have friends that you hang out with them and afterwards you feel so drained, right? When we have other friends who just have a lot of energy, they're like Himalayan salt lamps, you like being around them. Uh, so you wanna hang out with people like that. You wanna make sure that you drink clean charged water without fluoride or chlorine and that sort of thing. Um, eating whole foods, obviously. Uh, avoiding chemicals like crazy, they're really hard for your body to process, especially any kind of chemical scent. And this is a really important one. I, I think what I discovered exploring the field was that I was finding that uh, 
really the biggest thing that I was treating was a kind of emotional constipation. That people were judging their emotions, whether it was their sadness, their anger, their jealousy, um, and, and sort of suppressing their experience of that. You know, an emotion is an electrochemical event. It's a thing. It arises, and it, and it crests, and then it falls away. And if an emotion starts to rise and you push it down, that's actually life force, and you're sequestering it, and it has to go figure out where it's going to hang out in your body. Um, and, and then that, that becomes not available to you. Speaking your truth. Uh, again, you know, we, the number one prescribed drug in America is actually thyroid medication. And I think a great many people don't feel at liberty to speak their truth and, you know, energize this part of their body. Um, all laughing and crying, and, you know, to just really move energy through the throat. Honoring your natural inclinations or following the path of least resistance. That's how energy flows, right? That's how electricity flows. That's how water flows. We are water and electricity, and nature seeks to move us. And so when we learn to follow our natural inclinations, we end up in a nice conservation of energy. And then lastly, the idea of choosing ah over uh, because you know, when if you think about doing something, if it, if it feels uplifting and it feels great uh, and you do it, then that is energizing. And a lot of people out of duty and obligation and fear um, don't allow themselves to do that. And I just want to end with a quick little story about yesterday, um, my husband was in Starbucks and he met Vinny who was the drummer for the Herbie Hancock band. And he started telling Herbie about EU and about my work with sound healing. And Finney was really excited about that. And so he put us on the guest list for the Herbie Hancock concert last night at Mesa Arts Center. And so we went and then we got to go backstage and we got to meet Herbie Hancock, and <clears throat> which was really, I mean, I did not expect that at all. But what was so thrilling to me when, when we, when I learned we were going to do this, I went on Wikipedia and I looked to see how old Herbie is, and he's 77. And so when I went to meet him, I was looking for an old man. And when I saw him, he looked 50. And then when I saw him on stage, and he had assembled this team of amazing musicians, just amazing musicians, and they're all just playing their heart out, you know, just giving so much of their heart and soul and their aliveness. And, and then they came out for an encore at the end, and Herbie has this... Um, piano thing that's like a guitar, and he's playing, he's just rocking out on it. And, and this is after playing two hours, a 77-year-old man starts jumping up and down on the stage like he's 19. And, and I was like, that man manages his electricity really, really well. <laughs> he's a really good example of doing all the right things to raise his voltage. And so at the end, when we, we were talking, he said that he chants with his band, at the beginning of every concert before, before people show up. And I can never remember how the chant goes, but, uh, and, and he said that they do it with intention and that the intention is to give people the courage to really be themselves, to express themselves, to take the risk to really be alive. And I just thought that was brilliant. It's just brilliant. And, and what a wonderful thing to wish. So I just want to pass that on to you. I want to, I want to give you the courage and, and the interest to really take care of your own electrical body um, so that you can be, you know, as alive and vital and as engaged and as electric as you can be. Great. Thank you. Thank you.